Hello everyone, this is Professor Condry and welcome to Introduction to Film. So this week one lecture will focus on George Romero's Night of the Living Dead. Night of the Living Dead is a zombie movie and zombie movies are a subgenre of horror film. Like other horror films, zombie movies feature average people confronting supernatural forces in the form of monsters. Horror films are illogical and because of that, one thing they do is call attention to the fact that movies are the closest humans have come to replicating dreams, or more precisely, nightmares. Horror films operate on the level of the dream mind and reflect irrational fears, uncontrolled impulses, primal emotions, and more generally things we feel are out of our control. Horror films deal with fantastic and supernatural subjects, but are grounded in the cultures that produce them, just like any other film. Horror films reflect our cultural anxieties. The monster or evil in a horror film often stands for something we fear or struggle to understand and ultimately want to vanquish. Film monsters can take many forms. The monster may be a zombie, a vampire, the man in the lake, the blob, the haunted videotape, a killer clown, the overly enthusiastic parents of your white girlfriend the crazy Scandinavian cult. Regardless of what the monster is, what, it, what shape it takes, the monster is very often a projection of the anxieties that exist within a culture. There's no flesh left. There's hardly any blood. It's almost like a surgical operation. Great. Cartilage is decaying. They'll fall off one by one. I don't think I can stand it. Sharon, you'll have to take them off. Deathbed. The bed that eats people. Like I said, the monster can be anything. Absolutely anything. There's not always a perfect correspondence between the monster and the thing, because horror comes from an unconscious, irrational place. But the monster as metaphor has been an element of the genre, one that's been consciously exploited by filmmakers for decades now. In this sense, under all the blood and gore, beyond the jump scares, horror films can and do function as social critique or commentary. George Romero was quite aware of this when he created his low-budget Night of the Living Dead in 1968, and it's even more explicit in his follow-up, The Dawn of the Dead, which he made in 1970. What the hell is it? Looks like a shopping center, one of those big indoor malls. What are they doing? Why do they come here? Some kind of instinct, memory, what they used to do. This was an important place in their lives. Even when a horror film is not an intentional social critique, it carries with it and reflects the concerns of its time, just like any other film or any other work of art. Our main interest this week is in the camera and the invisible language of cinema, but I also want to help set up this film for a cultural analysis. First though, I'm going to give you a little bit of background about the film and its place and status in American film history. 
This is not the first zombie film ever made, but it basically establishes the blueprint or model for the modern zombie film as we know it. It's the precursor to movies like 28 Days Later and I Am Legend. This film was included in the National Film Registry of the Library of Congress in 1999 for its contribution to American film art. On one level, we can simply appreciate this film as a cheap, gory exploitation film. To be honest, it's a stupid zombie movie with low budget production values. But just because it doesn't aspire to high art doesn't mean it can't be treated as such. With all that established, let me talk about some social and historical context for Night of the Living Dead. I'm going to give you a little brief background on American life and culture in the period between 1967 and 1968, which is the time between when the film's production started and when the film was released. So production on Night of the Living Dead started and was completed in 1967, and the film was released the following year. This period was one of great social upheaval in the United States. Among the many events happening during this period was that America was at war. The Vietnam War is raging and going badly for the United States. The leaders of the country are trying to get the media to present a more positive view of what's going on in Southeast Asia, encouraging them to present to the public more positive news about the war and its progress. Every night, people turn on the evening news. Remember, during that time, there were only three channels, so everybody was watching the same thing. When they tune in, they hear stories about the latest U.S. military offensive and the number of American and Viet Cong troops killed that day. This earned the war the nickname of the Living Room War because people were experiencing it through the relatively new technology of television. While the war is going on, America was also broiled in social upheaval. All over the United States, people in opposition to the war and other related issues were protesting. In some cases, you'd get crowds of 10,000 people or more and people were being arrested in the streets, not unlike what we're seeing today. Images of these crowds were likewise broadcast to American homes, leaving a very strong impression in American viewers. Another context not unrelated to the Vietnam War was the Cold War going on between the United States and the Soviet Union. The term Cold War refers to indirect warfare between the US and the USSR following World War II. The fear of communism and the need to stop its spread through proxy wars like Vietnam was essential to American foreign policy at the time. This belief system pervaded the culture and expressed itself as a sort of paranoia. For example, children in this era conducted bomb drills where they would, quote, duck and cover by hiding under their desks in anticipation of an inevitable nuclear bomb lobbed by the communist Soviet Union. By the period of 1967-1968, Young people in particular were becoming skeptical about what they were being told about the spread of communism and, that, and about the need to be at war in Vietnam. Previous to this, people tended to have a lot of faith and trust in their government. But what happened during the Cold War and during the Vietnam era helped to erode that. Another really important context for this film and probably the most significant thing about the year 1967 was a series of events that we now refer to as the Long Hot Summer. In 1967, there are protests and uprisings in hundreds of, of cities across the United States because of abusive policing and racial discrimination against black people. Another crucial event from this period was Martin Luther King Jr.'s Beyond Vietnam speech in which King came out explicitly against the war. King saw the war as a moral and humanitarian failure one that invested money in militarism while ignoring the economic needs of the poor. Exactly one year after he gave this speech, he was assassinated. 1967 is also significant for a Supreme Court case. In 1967, Loving versus Virginia was decided. Through this decision, the Supreme Court declares all state laws prohibiting interracial marriage to be unconstitutional. The Loving versus Virginia case was, was one of the last pieces and the dismantling of legal segregation in the United States. But American culture was still segregated as a practical matter, including the worlds of film and popular entertainment. There were some breakthrough African-American actors like Sidney Poitier, who earned le leading roles in major studio films. But even in Poitier's case, the films that he did in this era, particularly in 1967, were explicitly about race and dealing with racism. 
The fact is white audiences were not comfortable with films featuring black actors in lead roles or integrated casts more generally, unless the black characters conform to certain racist stereotypes. Racism, social unrest, the war, paranoia, distrust of authority, all these currents are the backdrop for this film. To be clear, the film doesn't explicitly address these issues. And while Romero himself has claimed his intention was never to make a message movie about race in America, a film made in the period between 67 and 68 with a black actor, Dwayne Jones, in the lead role could not escape these contexts. Similarly, a film where people are tuning into their televisions to get information about an existential threat can't be untangled from the experience of people relying on television to find out about the war abroad and the civil unrest at home. In this sense, the media serves as sort of a character itself in this film. Now we're gonna switch our focus to the discussion questions. One thing I'd like you to consider is just simply this. Did you enjoy the film? Why or why not? If you didn't enjoy it or if you did enjoy it, in what respects did this film succeed or fail for you? Next question. Did this film remind you of any other films you've seen before? If you're familiar with other zombie films or horror films more generally, how did this movie compare to what you're used to? Also, how might we link the details of this film with what we know about America in the mid to late 1960s, as I've just laid it out to you? Can we find implicit meanings under the surface of what is explicitly just a movie about a bunch of brain-eating zombies? Also, is there anything in this film that reminds you of contemporary America, our world today? Perhaps relatedly, is there anything about this movie that seems distinctly American, besides the setting, of course, regardless of time? So formal analysis and the camera is part of the theme for the week. So in addition to these cultural analysis questions, I'd like you to be paying attention to and thinking about cinematography here. So what I'd like to ask you to do is to note and be prepared to discuss examples of camera technique in this film. Can you find examples of the following ways of moving the camera? The tilt shot, the pan shot, tracking or dolly shot, crane shot, steady cam. Now steady cam wasn't um, invented and implemented yet, so we may not find that, but certainly handheld, um, dolly in or dolly out, zoom in or zoom out. Now don't think of this as an Easter egg hunt. It's okay if you don't see any one of these in the movie, but um, I want you to be at least conscious of them and seeing if you can pick up on them. Additionally, can you find examples involving positioning the height and angle of the camera? For example, eye level shots, low angle shots, high angle shots, aerial shots, or bird's eye shots, the Dutch angle shot, single character POV, or group POV. Again, if you didn't find one or more of these, don't worry, just do your best to identify examples. Another question about formal analysis. Beyond being able to simply identify examples of the use of camera, I want you to think about this. Of the examples you notice where a particular camera technique was employed, can you identify any moments where the technique appeared to be supporting or reinforcing the action on the screen in some way? Think about what the book and lecture had to say about the invisible language of the camera and how film form can serve film content. Homework two is really related to this last question. So I want you to write a couple paragraphs. How you organize these are up to you. I give you some options here. The idea in any case is to be able to describe how certain techniques are reinforcing or supporting the action on the screen. If you'd like to do some more reading on this film and some of the things that I talked about, I've provided some sources here at the end of the slide. Um, you can find these links inside the lecture slide. Um, they cover a lot of the ground that I talked about when I talked about American culture and uh, reading this film through the lens of the social upheaval and racial politics of the time. So if you're anyone, if any of this stuff was interesting to you, this is the place you could take a look at it. Be aware that you're going to find spoilers here. So you might just watch the film first before you read this because it's going to, these articles are going to give things away. Last but not least, this film definitely deserves a content warning for violence and extreme gore. It is gross. 
it offended people at the time when it came out. Um, people thought the violence was pornographic. It was so bad by their by their standards. But um, there's definitely stuff in here that's uh, disturbing um, that involves violence. So just be aware of that.